Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Natick. For those of you who haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I work at Myrick O'Connell, biggest law firm outside of Boston. Mm -hmm. Biggest law firm. So, and because there are 70 of us, everybody does what they like. I like this. Uh, and this show, though, is not about elder law. It's about my friends Frank and Mary, whom you may have seen if you've ever seen me do a seminar. I always talk about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and the fact that their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if you live in Natick, you want to die in Natick. You don't want to go live with your kids in Austin or in Colorado Springs. Or, you know, you want to be here because this is where your friends are and it's got the community that you know. So the question is, who are the people that you need to know and what are the programs that you need to know about so that you can stay right here in Natick? So of course, I don't know that because I live far away in Marlboro, uh, a <laughs> long ways away. So I was able to convince though my friend Susan Ramsey, uh, whom I had met because of doing Elder Law, um, to be my co-host because she finds all these great people and gets to talk, who get to talk about a lot of the great programs, some of which Susan has really kind of been the force behind implementing, although she never talks about that. So <laughs> she's got another great guest, I am told, today. So Susan, who is our we guest do. today? We do. I thought I'm really excited to introduce um, to you and to our viewer viewing audience our newest staff member, Lindsay Quillen. And Lindsay is joining us to head up a new program that we are currently, our working title is the Natick Conversation Project. Mm -hmm. And it is a program that is um, helping us build awareness and comfort around talking about that subject folks don't want to talk about, but planning for death and sharing our plans and our wishes with other people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm delighted to acknowledge that the Metro West Health Foundation approached the Council on Aging and asked if we would help um, launch this program here in Natick and they have very generously provided us the funds and the support to do this. And I'm delighted to introduce Lindsay as our um, coordinator of the Native Conversation Project, and she comes to us with a wealth of experience, and um, I think maybe first we could ask Lindsay to About share with you. the audience. Because, <laughs> because you're, not just, you're not just new to them, you're new to you're I'm new, new to, to everybody. Us. So that's <laughs> right. great, and this right. is really exciting, because once again, one of the purposes of this show is so that folks can really connect a name with a face, right. so if they mm -hmm. hear about the Conversations Project, it's not this kind of theoretical thing. It's like right. you, right? There's a person so, there. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm just curious. So how did you get here? You told me that you're not a from you're not from Natick. Or I'm not you? from Natick or, or uh, at all, really. Yeah. I am from Central Massachusetts yeah. by way of Connecticut for undergrad after undergrad and grad school, yeah. and then some yeah. working professionally there. But I've been a social worker now for 17 years. So and that's what you always did with social work. Always social work with older yeah. adults and their caregivers. Oh, oh and I'm always focus on older adults. Really, always been that person that in the courses, you know. Everyone's talking about social work and what demographics they're going to be working with, yeah. and it was children, all the hands go up, addictions, all the hands go up, and then towards the end they finally say something like aging, and I do the, I'm the only yeah. one? How is that even possible? Everybody in every population is aging. So so, so just as a curiosity, why, why is that? Was this, were you really close to like a grandparent when you were, is there a re, did you I work in a so. nursing home? I was, did, what, what, I have. <laughs> what, yeah, so what, what but was But for the, me, I think it started as a, as a child. I grew up, um, I lived in the Netherlands for a few years and then when yeah. we moved back, we, my family moved into my great grandmother's house and she moved into my grandmother's house across two streets, but pretty much across the street. So I was able to see how my grandmother took in my great grandmother to help her and keep her at home. And yeah. she lived to be 99. She got the, the Golden Tip Cane Award back when I was like 10 years old. And I just remembered the being gold. so, that's, that's amazing. It was so cool that she was yeah. the oldest person in town, in town and she had been through right. so much. So I, I, I attribute my love for the aging population and, and learning more about aging as a process across generations to what I was raised with, what I had around right. in my family when I was younger. So I think that was really my, my motivating factor initially. So, so it makes you a natural for this project. And so what's the project Absolutely. about? Can you, can you just well, I'm gonna turn that over to Lindsay okay. because um, she has um, started just about uh, four to six weeks ago now and has um, hit the ground running and <laughs> hasn't looked back. She has formed a steering committee. She um, this week hosted um, a luncheon with the clergy here in Natick mm -hmm. and 
is really building strong community connections and has a lot of very interesting ideas and plans that we are going to be seeing come to fruition over the next several months. And, and, and once again, kudos to the Metro West Health Foundation yes. to, for seeing Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're just so rarely blessed in this set of communities to have Metro West there because right. it's so usually so hard to get those dollars to really try something. Right, you know? and it's really right. to help try to shift the the culture and kind of the stigma um, and the hesitancy about expressing what your wishes are and then um, maybe doing that but then also feeling comfortable to be sure you're sharing them with your family right. and with especially the people that you want to entrust to make decisions on your right. behalf if that were needed but also your medical providers and your yeah. attorney um, it's really just a whole host of people that I think it's important to share this information with um, and I think it will over time if people embrace that idea mm -hmm. um, I think it's just a benefit to families um, yes. so I Lindsay, think it allows you, them to yep. celebrate life and uh, in a much different way to celebrate life I was just mm -hmm. gonna say that that's just, really what it's all about it's not about end of life so much as it is about how do you want to live your life? What do you want your life to look like? And, and it's not just older adults. I know it's the conversation is, is happening with the Council on Aging, but we're really looking at anyone who's 18 and older and able to mm -hmm. be making their own decisions to say, if there were an event that I wasn't able to speak for myself, these are the things that I would or wouldn't want to have done medically as well as how I might want to live my life in those last days or during those illnesses if that were to happen to me. And so, kind of, what's the what's the plan? What how are you how are you thinking this is this is rolling That's out? That's a loaded question, That's a, isn't it? Is a, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would look at I would say that the conversation project nationally there is a it's a wonderful campaign, public health awareness, and it really is beyond just individuals. Where it's nationally, we have seventy over seventy percent of people want to die at home when they're asked. But the reality, unfortunately, is that more than 70% of people who are passing away are doing so in the hospital or in ICU settings. So right. we're not Facility. honoring yeah. what our wishes are for ourselves even right. by making sure that we put those things in place and have those conversations that are all too often taboo for us to talk about. And I suppose one of the, one of the well, first of all, one of the benefits of the Conversations Project, I heard that this project actually started in this area. It's become national. Out of but, Boston, yes. Yeah, that it, but that's a real big deal. Yes. So, so how do you do that? How do you, how do you, it, because for all, so many people, and once again, I've mm -hmm. got a ton of clients who, do you really want to be talking about this? Not so much, right? right? Even with their lawyer, you know, or even because right. it's very, very private. And their kids, forget it. Right. Ma, you're never going to die. Why are we talking about this, mm -hmm. right? So how do you, how do you, how do you start? That we start with awareness, and that's yeah. really our first push has been kind of making sure that we're letting people know that we're starting this program here in Natick and that yeah. we're going to be, be doing it. Uh, if I find it interesting as I meet people at the center and I tell them what I'm doing, they kind of go, oh, oh, that's great. Oh, I'm all set, though. I'm, I'm okay. And, or I get the reaction of, oh, that's oh. a tough one for you to be pulling in, huh? <laughs> and, and they're right. It is because it's it's... It is the stigma of we don't want to talk about death. We don't want to, our society doesn't want to acknowledge aging for the most part in general as well. We're dyeing our hair, we're making sure we're not eating things that you know, are going to add on those extra pounds or trying to have this image of what a healthy life is. But when right. it comes down to it, we want to make sure that you're not just a healthy life, but a good quality of life. And having that conversation and letting people know that what we're doing, it might be working, but what happens in the worst case scenario situation? Yeah. And I've been teased by a lot of my friends that I'm that girl that likes to bring up the worst case scenario, but I also think that by planning for that, whether it happens or not, I'd rather plan for it and have it never happen than that one time where I am in the ICU and not able to speak for myself and so-and-so is making decisions because I never filled out a healthcare proxy. Whereas yep. now I know that I have people in place, my family's around that, everybody's together in who that person would be to make a decision. And I, I feel comfortable knowing that if anything happened, if I were in an accident on the way home today or something, God forbid, but I have that in place to know that, that, that my wishes would be heard. That mm -hmm. someone is there. I often use the example, say, you know, you, you think about that, typically people think about this stuff in terms of, mm -hmm. oh yes, I did a DNR or not. Like, you know, so, so you know, if my heart stops, 
there's a document that says what to do, right? right? But, and they're always thinking about this in terms of this kind of moment, mm -hmm. this imaginary moment that you've got where this crisis has happened and, and it's life or death, right? Mm -hmm. And they never think in terms of, suppose you had that stroke, right? right? And now you had the stroke and you're not dead because people don't die of this stuff anymore. Right. I remember using the, we were talking before, that statistic, this right. amazing statistic I saw that so when, when, you're so young, when we were growing up, <laughs> when we were growing up, people would have like a heart attack and they died, right? Mm -hmm. People would have a stroke, they died. Right, right. And it just seemed, the older I get, it just like doesn't happen. So then I saw this, I saw this statistic that, that, that in, in, if, in 1970, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your chances of dying within two weeks were 30%. Right. They are now 3%. Everybody lives. Now mm -hmm. they may not be in great shape, right? right? So suppose you had that heart attack and now you're not in great shape and you're at home, right? And you're living and you're in a bed and you're bed bound, blah, 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 and then you get pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, do you want to go to the hospital? Because right. you go to the hospital, they can take care of the pneumonia, but now you're coming back home to where you were. Mm -hmm. Do you really want to come home? And then the question is, if, if you can't communicate because of that stroke, is there a proxy there that can speak for you? And do they know that answer? There's no correct answer. Right. right, right. The answer right, is it's right. your life. Yes. But do they know the answer? Right. Your right. answer. Your, your answer. answer. <laughs> right. Not their answer for right. you do or they what know their your desires answer. would be, yeah. but to be able to communicate what your wishes are, even if they're different than what their wishes for you might be. Right. And that's one of the big big pieces about even healthcare proxy, but also having those conversations Stations, and talking right. with the entire family. I'm one of four kids, so and I am my parents' healthcare proxy. And that became an issue a few times, but it became an issue because we all talked about it and made the decision. My parents made the decision, but we talked about it all together and had that conversation to say, two of them are out of state, one of them, two of us are local, yeah. children here, this, that, and the other thing. But ultimately it came down to who's gonna be the one to stand up and make the tough decisions when the time comes and stand up to the doctors sometimes or the medical right. staff that- Right, and not be afraid to be are disagreement. Pushing, pushing, pushing to heal, heal, heal. That's what they're trained to do. And that, that's another, con a whole other conversation that could be that's had as well, but yeah. to be able to stand up and, and, and speak those wishes for those people when you're in that so, position. So we're really but, hoping yeah. to, you know, find opportunities and different forums and in different ways yeah. um, for everybody 18 and older here in NADEC um, to be able to come together and explore their feelings around these issues and really begin to think about it. And with specificity in some regards, I think all of us today, if you have to check in for your um, you know, annual physical or it's something you know, fairly uh, preventative care related with your primary care or if you're going in for surgery, it's the quick question, you know, do you have the healthcare proxy? And most of us say yes. And probably the last time I looked at mine was maybe 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but you don't even in that quick setting wanna have to have a follow-up question right. or have to think about it. So it's easy to say yes, get the box checked off and move along. So we're hoping that we can, and, or the other side of that often, and myself, <laughs> I can use as an example, I would want no, you know, advance extreme measures taken and have that conversation in college, you know, with um, my person who was going to be my healthcare proxy and, and vice versa. But what does that really mean? So for me, if I happen to have been in an, an extreme accident, my definition of extreme measures might be extraordinarily different right. than my friends. So that's I think right. that's part mm -hmm. of what we're hoping to chip away at with right. people to not feel so guarded or uncomfortable and, and again provide them the opportunities to explore these right. feelings and decisions um, in many different ways many different times so that it does feel a little bit more every day and to add to that that it's not being done in a crisis because yes. when right. there's a crisis right. that's happening the worst possible time right that's is. when everyone's yep. coming together with their own opinions of what mom or dad or aunt or uncle or best friend might have said before in the past and all the things that their interpretations of what that might have meant and it's in a crisis and nobody makes really great decisions in a crisis, in a crisis. for the most part right. <laughs> um, right. but when you're in that situation it also will help with the grieving process should that event end in a death for someone if you made decisions or you were the healthcare proxy left to make the decisions and you made decisions you know that person would have wanted or felt like that was the right decision for them the grieving process on the other end of that is going to be a lot easier than if it was all 
just a guess or wing and a right. prayer, right. as a lot of people will say. I, right. I don't know what they would want. I, I guess try this, and this didn't work, or it did mm -hmm. work, and now they're not able to communicate, and they don't have the, the quality of life they maybe wanted to have. I mean, our technology is amazing. Our medical care is amazing, but it also can go to the farthest extreme, extreme. of maintaining life beyond what somebody might have wanted for themselves. Yeah, what you really quality. want. Yeah, I think also with us um, looking to the Conversations Project um, and being able to have some consultant uh, time with them on developing our project here in Natick, um, it also will explore, you know, kind of the topics about a healthcare pro uh, proxy. I think Lindsay and I were chatting the other day and saying like, gee, when we were younger, we automatically, of course my parents would make yep. those decisions. Um, but as we continued in the conversation, we realized um, our parents are of a certain generation, and mm -hmm. although they would be in a stressful situation, is that really good for them? Could they make the best decision in that moment? And, and also, they make, they make and your more, decision? Right. right, my decision, <laughs> and more importantly, of a generation where there was great respect and reference to the doctors, mm -hmm. and they would just defer to them. And that That's could right. be a problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's even helping people. I'm the questioner. When I, I was in the <laughs> hospital and had that situation, I thought if my mom was the one making decisions, the care would have been a very different situation for me. That was the, the wake up call of well, right. time to, to I'm going to name somebody that, else. That's right. That's, that's <laughs> right. Really so no that's disrespect the, to my mom yeah. either, and she right. understood. <laughs> right. So it's like providing opportunities like that and right. presenting people with material and posing questions that can hopefully get people thinking and feeling comfortable to explore lots of different options for themselves. That's pretty. That's pretty exciting. So, mm -hmm. so I'm curious. Have you talked to any doctors around here about this? I haven't gotten in touch with doctors here I'll, just yet, but yeah. I have a couple that I've been referred to, so I'm looking forward to connecting with them, them this week and seeing what happens there. I actually was involved well a couple of years ago before this started with us here yeah. uh, with a gentleman in a primary care practice in Central Mass, and he did a conversation project conversation, and at the time I didn't know what that really was, just to talk about end of life, and he thought it would be a good balance to have a social worker there as well. and. So I, I agreed and went with him, and, and I remember sitting there thinking, he's really negative about advanced directives. He's you know, really emphasizing, do not resuscitate, do not do this, do not do that, which apparently doctors are kind of the highest uh, rate of individuals who deny care because mm. they seem to see a different way than, than I do, I guess, perhaps, but I'm also younger than most of those doctors I've worked with or yeah. talked to. Um, yeah. But the idea of, of saying, don't do the treatment, live your life, take this, and after he was done, then I came in and all social worky. It's your choice. You get to do whatever you want, whether you want to listen to what he's saying here, or if you're not at that point, maybe you do still want to have resuscitation and have right. that that done, or maybe having intubation is worth it for you if it means that two weeks later they're able to take that out and you are able to breathe again. Right, and I, I remember hearing uh, actually this is this is a person who was in charge of uh, intake at the mm -hmm. at the Martha's Vineyard Hospital. We've talked about. You know, if you've got lung, if you've had lung problems, right. then that conversation about do, if you've stopped breathing, do you want someone to try to help you breathe, right. is a very different conversation from mm -hmm. if you've never had a lung problem. Mm -hmm. right. Because there's a good chance that maybe your lung are just having a problem because you've got a lung problem, right. and mm -hmm. that and that dealing with that, you can kind of continue to live your life, right? right? But I was, it's funny, as you were talking about getting together with your parents, I was saying to myself, wow, your parents actually initiated that conversation? Oh, no, I did. <laughs> you did. You did. She's the trailblazer. But, but the advantage of having all the other kids there, right. as opposed to those terrible conversations where somebody has is, is got an issue, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, the, for the first time, you're hearing the brother from California right. say, I don't think this is right. You know, right. Uh, this we is not what mom would have wanted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cause, because you would you would all have your own attitudes toward what you think they would want, unless they actually said it. Right. And ideally, unless they wrote it down. Right. Unless they wrote it down. I remember talking to this wonderful woman who just retired from uh, Deb Gittner, who was mm -hmm. a geriatric care manager from her, this area, who just actually just recently retired because her folks live in Florida, so she was moving down mm -hmm. to take care of them. But she said she remembered going to the hospital because her father-in-law had had a problem. And her father-in-law, and, and she remembered that the previous Thanksgiving, they were around the Thanksgiving table, and, and her father-in-law had talked about this. The, apparently, I th think the mother-in-law had, mother had passed. So, and, and it was her, it, her and her husband, who was the son, you know, and the others, and they were just kind of talking about, so this is kind of really how I think about this stuff, because mm -hmm. this person had had some medical problems, 
and therefore had spent some time thinking about it. And I think that's, you know, once you've done that. But, he, but she, she said it was hard because she got a call from her husband that the husband had heard from the hospital. Dad had a problem, they're rushing him into the, to the, to the ICU. We're heading to the hospital. We've got to make these kinds of literally life or death decisions. And she found herself saying, now what did he say again? What did he say again? Right? Because nobody wrote anything down. Right. Right? So now you're trying to remember, as you go back to in this stressful situation, mm -hmm. what it is that this wonderful person, who they were both really close to, mm -hmm. would really want right now. The doctors have all got their opinions. Everybody's right. got an opinion here. Mm -hmm. Right? But what did that person really want? Right. right? So to have it written down was like this really yeah. crucial thing. Mm -hmm. So you would, you would mention, by the way, before that you were starting reaching out to the faith community? Yes. We had an inter interfaith community uh, clergy lunch just Tuesday this week, yep. even. Yeah. Um, so we can you talk about that? How we, did that go? What was, what was the it sense? It was an interesting the conversation. There? It was we had you know interfaiths. We have yeah. all different faiths that were there and all working within working with people obviously with end of life issues A and family issues, issues. Right. and mm -hmm. so right. we're looking forward to having some collaborations and and in the fall there's going to be a conversation Sabbath which is two weekends at the end of October into November. Um, so we're hoping that we'll have a number of churches in, in Natick specifically to be a part of that national campaign. Too. Conversation Sabbath. Sabbath. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, Pretty so, neat, and, right? And, and the concept, <laughs> yeah, and the concept is? The concept is, is to bring the conversation of end of life and mortality and planning to the congregations and to have whether it be sermons or conversations or uh, preachings, groups that they do maybe with some of their uh, adult education programs, but to really have a, a concentrated focus at the same time across the country where we're really focusing on the faith-based communities to also right. bring that because for most people that's something that you're thinking about it's not just the medical care but we're mm -hmm. talking about what happens after life what are your beliefs what right. what can you do for treatment or not are there faith-based um, traditions that might change some of those answers or responses that you might have when you're thinking about the end of life or an emergency situation like that. Right, and I suppose those are folks who are having the conversation probably more than just about anybody, right. except for the, maybe the doctors and the geriatric mm -hmm. care managers right. about mm -hmm. kind of like dealing with those, mm -hmm. those questions. And it must have been interesting, you must have heard a variety of comments around the room oh, about yes. this. Yep. Yes? Yep. And, and different levels too. I, I mean, everyone seems to be, they showed up. So as I look at it, we're, they they're engaged. They showed up. <laughs> they that's, showed right. up. that's the first stop. Uh, and then we'll keep going from there to see how we can continue in the, in the future and moving forward to make more, more collaborative efforts together. But that's really what mm -hmm. we're looking to do and, with and, this project here in Natick is yeah. to build the community together around it and to continue that, that conversation as a community. And you're also saying specifically, while it is kind of being based through the Council on Aging, mm -hmm. this isn't just all about seniors correct because I know that in 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 Westboro mm -hmm. the the, uh, the 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 uh, I can't remember if it's the superintendent of schools or the high the, the high school principal wants to build this into the program for next year for the seniors great that oh. you just make it part of graduating yeah. wow. that you have a health care proxy That's and amazing. you do this conversation Which because she, because she said you know the kid you know the kids don't you don't stop to think right. you go away right. to college you have a problem no one can talk for you. Right, you're 18, right. 18 now. You're right. you're and 18. the doctors won't talk to your parents right. unless something's in writing. Right. So it becomes a rite of passage, yeah. you know. Yeah. So right. that, that's a great approach. Yeah, yeah. So, so are you figuring you're going to do, be, be doing events also at the senior center? Is, oh yes. <laughs> and it's kind of our our home base. Yeah. Um, in our benefit here in Natick is that we're a community senior center. So, oh, that's right. We host programs, and all of our programs, even at the Council of Aging, are available to anyone of any age, because yeah. we're all aging in Natick. So we have no many thousands of people, people like that we're <laughs> that we're reaching out to mm -hmm. every day, which is um, really exciting. Yeah, so that, okay, so that's a big deal. So that'll be kind of the center, and you're thinking about churches, yep. and you may be thinking about other kinds of locations. Right. And right. so will you be trying to bring people in to actually talk about this? Because one of the things that, we're, that we were just talking about before the show was actually doing, maybe doing some things even here, mm -hmm. right, around this kind of issue, so you mm -hmm. get kind of people more engaged. But I suppose it's really handy that you have a hospital here. Yes. Right, so when you think about the doctors, right, yeah. So that, that's very interesting too. One of the members of the clergy lunch uh, was the pastor, pastoral care coordinator, coordinator. Yes. Um, for um, 
Metro West Medical Center, which has two campuses, one here in Natick and right. one mm -hmm. in Framingham. And it was uh, very striking because I think um, that component within the hospital setting is one that people, when they're in that emergent uh, crisis situation, um, overlook. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really good to have that connection mm -hmm. and uh, have that perspective right. because I think it was um, one that I hadn't thought about and really recognize that uh, unit in a hospital right. as being such a great resource and really likely comfort for a right. family um, or one who could guide them through some decision making mm -hmm. if needed. I think also next month at the center we're going to be hosting a movie and a conversation. Actually next um, Wednesday. Or, actually next Wednesday. <laughs> um, and so, which is really exciting. So we're different types of events and we've been toying, um, exploring the idea of trying to engage the community and kind of um, all joining us in reading a particular book mm -hmm. and then coming together at different venues here in Natick um, to have some book discussions. That's also really exciting. Yeah. We gotta change it up as many ways as we can because we're not after just one group of individuals right. or one, right you know, one interest area. We want to make sure that we're reaching people as the proper conversation project says where they live, work, and pray. So we're we're heading out to any areas where people of interest, uh, right. social groups, as well as working with people in at their place of employment with our own mm -hmm. colleagues at sure. work as well. And, sure. and breaking it down, it, just having our own conversations with each other is a way of helping others to see that if we can talk about it openly and freely, everybody can talk, we can about, all talk and I, about it. And I suppose you raise a good point in terms of just raising books. It's a kind of a natural thing for the library to be mm -hmm. interested in, mm -hmm. yeah. in terms of really mm -hmm. having those books available. Because I was just mm -hmm. going to say, so have you read The Art of Dying Well? I have that on my desk, yeah. actually. <laughs> it's so good. I mean, I know. I mean, I was, I, so I found myself reading this in bed, and my wife is like, well, that's kind of a morose topic. To, I said, no, this is really good. Because once again, going to the conversation that we were talking about, it really talked to these kind of different stages in your life. The first stage being, oh, what do they, they call it? It wasn't called recuperation or recovery, but it's like something happened in your back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you, had, you had a cancer thing, they had the operation, you're back. Or you had the hard thing and you got some stents and you're back and, you, and you're really back, mm -hmm. you know, except it happened. Right. Except it happened. And so now perhaps you know we all die in different ways, right? right? We all, that maybe that's your path, you know, or maybe you have, you've had some memory problems, but you know, your family's had a lot of memory problems. Right. So maybe, you know, that's kind of, maybe Alzheimer's is your path, you know. So, but then it goes to the, uh, to, to, to it, kind of following that and saying kind of as you get into different kind of stages of your life where that, where the path becomes clearer. So how do you deal with those issues? Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to mention one other thing which kind of struck me. It, it, it spoke to the thing you had mentioned earlier. We all think we want, we say we want to die at home. Right. And as the woman, the woman wrote the book said, maybe you don't. <laughs> maybe you want to be in a really good hospital or nursing home, right? Except that what that means is there needs to be special places in those hospitals right. and nursing homes, right? Where you can die peacefully there. Mm -hmm. So, I, I digress. Thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much yet again for having again, this we wonderful, had a great show. this wonderful person. Thank you so much <laughs> for you. for coming. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Hopefully, we can have you come back on, right? To kind of, as this progresses. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for for thank you very much for watching, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the uh, next installment of Frank and Mary here in Natick. Thank you.